Hello, good evening. My name is Nathaniel Osgood from the Computational Epidemiology and Public Health Informatics Lab at the University of Saskatchewan. Within this presentation, by request, I'm going to be providing a, a tutorial here on application of particle filtering to dynamic models within the health area. This talk is, again by request, something that, that offers quite a bit of substance um, in terms of exploring this topic. But at the same time, given the diversity of audience in the room, I want to be sure that every person here gets some takeaway insights from this talk. For some in the room with less of a mathematical background, you may find my motivations and metaphors where I start um, helpful for grounding and giving some intuition about where we're going. For those who are dying to, to implement particle filtering for dynamic models, I'll be providing a very brief one slide uh, description the nitty-gritty of how particle filtering can be implemented. Uh, but many of those in the room are, are mathematicians, and for them, they may be interested in understanding what is the formal mathematical foundation for particle filtering, and I'll be discussing that, and then be continuing on to a discussion of how and why this is realized through the use of these particles in sequential importance sampling as time allows. I'll then be finishing up with some discussion of balancing between model stochastics and, and the roles in which they play within, a, within this context. I'll be talking about the application of particle filtering to agent-based models and be providing the results of a summary. So the motivations and metaphors here are, are fourfold. Firstly, it's the desire to avoid open loop models, models that are created and, and then are simply used. Rather, we want such models are, are subject to risk, and rather we'd like something that will provide ongoing updates to, to model state. Similarly, this is tied in with the notion of avoiding model obsolescence. So the context I'd like to use as an exemplar will be one familiar to most people in the room, and it, it has to do with outbreak response. The idea here is that many concerns around response to outbreaks concern mobilization of resources um, based on our understanding of how the outbreak is likely to evolve. And often this is based on regular, such as weekly reporting, give some sense of where we're at, but left to its own devices, little clarity on what lies forward. And our interest here lies in anticipating trajectories of incident cases, understanding to what degree different interventions uh, might be most desirable going forward, understanding the current situation. But the fact is, with dynamic models traditionally, we have tended to build a model on the one hand, Build it up, conceptualize, formulate, parameterize, calibrate it, cross validate it, test it, and have a model fit for use that's then used. But while it's being used, that model's depiction of the initial state gets increasingly disconnected from the world. And while we can reformulate a model and regrounded on the current situation rather than the situation at the time it was built a year or two ago. That's a, it's a heavyweight process to realign it. And the fact is, even the most detailed models, strong models at the time they were built, eventually diverge from the empirical situation as time passes. Amongst other things, this is due to the fact that the world has factors that are, for all intents and purposes, stochastic. Um, from the purposes of, of health models. Um, weather being a case in point, the fluctuations of the economy, etc. And it's inevitable, even the very best of model evidenced in the best way is going to diverge from the vagaries of stochastics in the world. But typically models have many other shortcomings, simplifications, etc. 
Secondly, often there's really not time in, in the context of an outbreak response, particularly to a novel uh, infection or a new strain of an infection, to really create a highly grounded model. Often we're, we're caught between the scylla of trying to plan based on a, a quite inaccurate model that grows disconnected from the actual situation. Um, and by contrast, the, the Charybdis of having a highly detailed model that isn't available in time for planning. So the motivation here is we'd like to avoid these models that we build and then just use while they become updated. We'd like to avoid, as we're blindfolding our models to incoming data, have them be open loop and instead be able to remove that blindfold. Most people in the room here will have a very, who live in the Toronto area, will have a very good mental model as to how to get home. But even the best of mental models is not going to get you home safely with closed eyes or blindfolded. You need a good model, but you need ongoing observations. So the solution vision we're working towards here includes frequently regrounded and quickly formulated models that can be automatically regrounded as new evidence comes in. And where the model state, the understanding of the current situation, the initial point, as it were, of the model, is regrounded in an ongoing way with, uh, with the latest evidence, and in a way that's rigorous mathematically. And it turns out that by so doing, and combining the incoming data with the logic of the model, we can illuminate not just areas that are directly measured from the population, but areas that affect those, areas upstream as it were. So we're seeking here a system a bit like a weather report where it's, it's always advising us what the current situation is allowing us to project forward. Or you could think of it as like a GPS. It's, it, no matter where we are, it clues us into where we are and helps us navigate to where we want to want to go, such as evaluating different intervention options. It's not like a map where, excuse me, like a set of directions that we printed out, you know, uh, hours ago, and it's growing increasingly disconnected from the vagaries of what's actually happened, where we actually are. Instead, it's constantly updating to reflect our current situation so that we can get advice about where to go. Another metaphor here is We'd like to have a means of taking multiple lines of incoming data, which are increasingly common within today's big data environment, and knitting them together into a system-wide picture of what's going on, where each line of data may be highly incomplete, highly noisy and problematic, but where we can use a model to knit them together into a picture, not just the areas they illuminate, but a, as it were, a holistic picture of the entire system. And finally, we'd like to avoid, rather than relying on a single estimate of, of the model state that we project forward in some trajectory, uh, avoiding putting our eggs in one basket and having a probabilistic evolution and estimation of model state. So those are some, some directions about where we're going. We're moving away from open loop models, models are increasingly outdated, and towards models that are constantly updated, probabilistically updated to look forward, and that can knit together multiple lines of evidence. What I'm gonna be presenting to you today, on involving dynamic modeling with particle filtering, is an approach that we've applied to a wide variety of other contexts. For, for many of those contexts, applied it to quite a few models within that or several models within that context. These have been models at a wide variety of level of aggregation, some are underway, still as active lines of explorations. And the context in which we're using this is the context of a situation where we have data streaming in from a variety of sources, from sources such as Twitter um, and, and Google Trends, classification mechanisms such as Yelp, potentially in the future, um, scraped web pages, which give counts. 
and where ultimately that data can be combined, um, can be sorted through, can be classified with machine learning classifiers into incident case counts and, and, and counts for different data streams and knit together into a dynamic model. Now, three highly relevant techniques within this area are listed here. MCMC, which is really very well suited to dynamic models that are deterministic in character and where we're seeking to sample from static parameters. Particle filtering, which will be the focus of my discussion here today, which allows us to sample from the latent state of model, from the full state of the model, from posteriors of stochastic models. Particle filtering doesn't make really much sense to apply to a deterministic model. It's for models to incorporate at least some stochastics. And it then allows us to sample from the latent states, from stochastically evolving parameter scenario results, from trajectories of dynamics within that model, and the incremental gains of one intervention scenario, say, against another or against the baseline. Another technique that builds on particle filtering and MCMC and combines the two is one that we're very active in applying and these, this is particle MCMC and here we're again have a stochastic dynamic model and we're not only estimating what particle filtering can give us estimating from the underlying state of the system over time but also from these static static parameters okay so some high level facts about particle filtering this technique, this sequential Monte Carlo method. Well, as I noted, when it's applied to simulation models, it's only really meaningful if, if there includes some stochastic processes in the model. As we'll see, this, this is one of the reasons for this operationally is if we undergo resampling and a, a, uh, a particle is, is, uh, is duplicated, it doesn't make sense for it to be duplicated if the model is is deterministic. Um, it needs to diverge from its uh, sibling, as it were. Simulation model here um, goes through two sets of phases. It, it runs normally, predicts between observation points, and then at observation points it's corrected to align with empirical data. So it goes through these two stages. First, we're just the normal model. It's running between the observation points. But when an observation comes in, the latent state of that model is sampled. The full state of that model is sampled and estimated, as it were, to ground its understanding of the current situation based on all the observed points the, until now. However, this whole, fashion, this whole approach is, is performed in a recursive fashion, an online fashion. Rather than taking all the previous data points and re-estimating the state over all previous data points when a new data point comes in, instead that estimate from earlier is updated when new data comes in. It's, it's updated in a local fashion rather than recomputing everything from the start. It is compared to common filtering or other techniques, very loose distributional assumptions associated with it. So it's very versatile technique, particle filtering is. And it samples, as I had noted earlier, from the state distribution or the distribution of trajectories over time. So within this context, we're getting a probabilistic estimate of the current state of the system, say. And for that, each sample is represented by a particle. And these particles reflect competing hypotheses as to what's currently going on. And there's the survival of the fittest of them over time, where fitness is judged by how well they accord with, how well they match empirical data. So we are essentially running the model with all these different hypotheses about what's going on, and the hypotheses that are consistent with the incoming data flourish and are multiplied. Those that are inconsistent tend to die out. And to achieve this, 
we make use of important sampling. We sample from a distribution by particles that are associated with weights. Okay, that's a lot of stuff. We're running the model with particles. Particles undergo a survival of the fittest according to how well they match data. Multiplying if they match it really well, dying out if they tending to die out if they don't. How do we actually perform it? Well, it turns out at a mechanistic level, it's not that hard to implement. Take an ODE model. I'll focus on ODE models here. I'll comment on agent-based models later, which form a central leading part in our work. So we have an ODE. We subscript it by hundreds to thousands of particles. I wouldn't trust it for production runs without many hundreds of particles. Commonly, we use thousands, tens of thousands sometimes. Now, each particle here, it's key to emphasize, because the ODE, the entire ODE is subscripted by this, each particle has a complete copy of its model state, full copy of the model state, the state of the model. And the ODE model here, as I had noted earlier, must be stochastic. Now, at the very start, we're going to sample from an initial model state. It's probabilistic. Different particles will be, will have different hypotheses about what the initial model state is. But all their weights are going to uniformly be set to one. Now, between observations, okay, so that's the initial state. We have a distribution of particles. Now, as I had noted, the model, the particle filtering goes through two phases. Between observation points, we simply run this model forward. All particles evolve according to standard model dynamics. So each particle is associated with a state of the system. And we just integrate it forward in our ODE until the next point of observation. Okay, All the particles survive here. There's no dying out of particles here. And the particle weights, moreover, remain invariant. They're not changing during this phase. At the observation points is where the action happens. Okay, so at an observation point, when we have incoming data for each particle, we're going to multiply the particle weight by the likelihood of that particle observing the empirical datum, given that the state of that particle. So if the particle is one that posits, there's a lot of people infected now, and a lot of people susceptible, still susceptible, it's going to be predicting a certain number of incident cases that's larger based on that. And if what we actually see from the world is a large number of incident cases, it's going to say, oh, that's, for me, that's quite likely that I'd expect this. By contrast, if what we see from the world is no one gone infected in this past month, that particle has a likelihood of zero of observing that, or very low likelihood, I should say, not zero, but very low likelihood. And so its weight will be downgraded. By contrast, if the likelihood was high, its weight will be upgraded, will be en enlarged. And it turns out these weights are, are associated with this notion of sequential importance sampling. A particle at twice the weight means that it counts twice as much, essentially, when we sample. And when the particle weights become uh, too diverse, when the effective sample size associated with them is too low, we're going to undergo a resampling. And basically, particles with high weights reproduce and those with low weights are likely to disappear. We draw from the particles according to their weight. And although I won't go into a detail, it's straightforward to maintain what's called an ancestry matrix, which holds the lineage of particles, which allows us to sample, not just from a distribution over the current state at a given time, but over the trajectories uh, of, of state over time. How, how the system changed over time. So let's give an example here. So, so here we have measles. It's a published example. Uh, we have many variants of this model, very successfully applied. And suppose we have empirical data concerning 
incident case counts, both in aggregate over all ages, once a month, and once a year over in an age, age specific fashion. Well, what is a particle filter model going to give to us? Well, while a traditional model might give a particular trajectory over time for measles, what a particle filter model is going to give us is at any given point a distribution that's going to be sampled from. And ladies and gentlemen, uh, at a given point, we're going to be where there's an observation, we're going to be Again, having this process of adjusting the weights of particles, those that are consistent with that observation, we'll get a larger weight. Those that are inconsistent, we'll get a smaller weight. And we may undergo some resampling that weeds out those with lower weights. But in any case, those with higher weights are going to be, when it comes to sort of sampling the distribution of particles, more, more, uh, more highly, uh, highly uh, represented. Now, as we undergo this sort of sampling, we're going to be estimating, uh, moreover, the underlying state of that model. So, for example, we might have a model that's stratified into children and adults, and we're matching up data once a year that's uh, for children or for adults, the incident case counts, and each particle is going to have associated with it some estimate for right now for the total number of adults and the total number of children and that are in each of those states here. And we're going to multiply the likelihood of that particle, excuse me, multiply the weight of that particle, single weight, by a likelihood function that indicates the likelihood of observing a certain number of kids and a certain number of adults getting infected at a certain point given for each particle, given the, the state of that particle. And that will weight those particles uh, accordingly and tend to emphasize those that are consistent with with the observed data and downplay those that are not. By so doing, we can incorporate new data points as they come in. And if we've incorporated data to a certain point, we can then take our ensemble of particles and forward and, and sample going forward to project going forward by simply running each particle forward without adjusting its weight. We can then sample from future according to the weights of those particles. We can also look at the, the joint distribution over the state of the system as a whole by sampling from particles right now, by drawing from the particles according a probability according to their weight and it will give a, a joint distribution because every particle has some estimate for the current state of the system. Alternatively, we can run intervention scenarios. So this successive estimation at a given time from the empirical data is going to adjust the weight, but that each particle, because it has a representation of the full state of the system, can be sampled in, in terms of the different state variables. So if we can ask, for example, at a given time, what is the likely distribution for the number of, of child susceptibles, or the number of, say, at time two, 200, number of children who are exposed? More plausibly, at the current time, how many kids are likely susceptible? How many children are exposed at this time? How many children are likely to be infected at this time, which we see is estimated to be quite high here? And how many children are likely to be recovered? By running the model forward with absent new data, we can project how that's likely to evolve according to model dynamics with absent new data coming in. 
here you see the model is projecting two possibilities. There's some possibility that it's going to evolve with, with a growing number of susceptibles. But there's also a high probability that it, there may be enough of a set of outbreaks along the way that the number of susceptible children will be small. Okay, that's a bit, a bit of how it's implemented, but many of the mathematicians in the room will be asking, well, why does this work? What formal basis is this based on? I mean, it's, it's nice to talk about a, a little algorithm that we run, but on what formal foundation is this based? Well, it turns out it's based on uh, Bayesian mathematics, um, this, uh, theory of sequential Monte Carlo methods, and we'll talk about these. Okay, so suppose we, for, the, for those from mathematical background here, suppose we have a state space model. We have some ordinary differential equations where we have n state variables. And we have some system evolving according to a stochastic process where there's some amount of noise um, uh, in the system over time. Uh, but we have uh, an evolution that's who's, uh, which is governed as well by deterministic or by, by um, according to uh, differential equations with that stochastic factor involved, so stochastic differential equations. And suppose that we consider um, time being an O by K, and without loss of generality, we're going to assume that observations arrive every one time unit is where we can pick our scale of time such that that's the case and we're going to advance the time from advance the model from time uh, k minus 1 to k um, uh, through uh, an integration measure um, integrating from uh, between those two times okay so in addition to that model governing model evolution as in control theory and other fields we're going to be imposing a measurement model as well so the idea is we have an underlying state x and a vector x that that evolves but we're also going to have a measurement model by which given a an underlying state x at time k we yield some measurements at time k and this measurement model includes some uncertainties, some noise affecting the observation. It's imperfect. We, we don't have a, a perfect measurement. You get back statistics which have some variability in them. <clears throat> and at time k here, we're going to be seeking to, to estimate state k to an estimate of the distribution of state x sub k, um, the current state of the system at time k, uh, based on all the observed data until this point. So the idea is we, you know, we, we have this data that we've observed to this point. What's the current state of the system, the underlying state of the system? And as it turns out, the methods we use can, can actually be used more generally to estimate the trajectories from of state from the first point until now. So some trajectories may go up initially and they go down, others may, may oscillate, but we'll be sampling from trajectories in general with, uh, uh, for many uses of particle filtering, most notably for particle MCMC. Now, it turns out that while our group has helped pioneer the application of MCMC, within the uh, two, two dynamic models, um, and that technique really falls flat in, in estimating this latent, this latent uh, state uh, or the state of the system at, at each point or, or the trajectories. Um, amongst other things, the dimensionality associated with this is, is just too high to sample effectively with MCMC. Instead, we, we seek a recursive way of, of estimating esti uh, x sub k from x sub k minus 1 when, when a new observation occurs. 
rather than sampling de novo using MCMC, attempting to sample the latent state of a stochastic process, which is a fool's errand here because of the level of stochastics within the system. We're going to be proceeding in a way that is recursive. And we're going to go through a prediction and update phase that's going to be quite central to this. And, and um, I'm describing this how, right now in terms of how it affects the, the distribution. But as we'll see, it will also affect how we realize this using weights and using particles, sequential importance sampling. So within the prediction step, we're going to simply integrate forward from state k minus 1 to the time just before time k, just prior to time k. Okay. Um, and that's going to occur according to the consistent, consistent um, application of the differential equations underlying the system. And then, at time k, this state will be integrated up to, to just, just prior to that, as it were, or at that time, is updated, is updated to state x of k using this update in, in a way that considers the current observation y sub k, okay? Um, and uh, we, we're going to perform that update in a way that takes into account the likelihood, given state x sub k minus, as it were, that we would observe x sub k. Okay, so uh, those particles which are, excuse me, um, those hypotheses which are more consistent with this new observation are going to be amplified, as it were. So the net effect of this prediction and updates have taken together is to update from the samples that we had after the last observation at time k minus 1, the, the understanding of the distribution we had of, of concerning the state of the system, and updating it to the distribution we have now, considering all the data until and including now. Okay? Okay, so we're going to talk about these things. It, it turns out that uh, the prediction step is. Um, fairly straightforward. I don't have time to go into this watching the time. Um, but if we assume that we have this knowledge available at the previous time, we can inductively uh, carry over and, um, and essentially uh, write this equation uh, here uh, in terms of this prediction step. And essentially this this process requires, depends only on this, uh, this distribution um, as it was at previous time, k minus 1. And uh, here, this, um, this step of, of mapping the system forward, this is simply running the system forward. Okay, so if we had our estimates before and we simply run the system forward, we can effectively sample from, um, from this, this state. So the prediction step, the step of, of predicting forward involves simply running forward from the previous time, having taken into account all the data until then, and simulating our system, system forward until um, now from that previous point. It's a straightforward application of the underlying rules of the stochastic differential equation. Now, when we're at observations, as I said, this is where the action happens. The model estimates of state are going to be uh, updated. Oops, excuse me. Uh, are going to be uh, updated, uh, as it were, corrected by empirical data. Our distribution of the underlying state that we had deduced from previous previous observations would be corrected by the new data. As it were, this is transitioning from a prior distribution, prior to observing the current data point, 
to a posterior which incorporates the current data point, which can, and that shapes the distribution in an important, um, important way. Okay. Um, uh, so we may have one data item, we may have, have several. And a key part of this is applying a likelihood function. And the likelihood function gives likely of the empirical data given the model state. Okay. Um, so given the model state, uh, what's the likelihood that we would observe um, the, uh, the empirical, empirical observation? So here we're updating the state at the time just before the current time point um, in a way that considers this observation. Okay. Now, the derivation of this, which I also have included in my supplemental slides, not just as for the prediction, is quite gnarly. Um, but, but fundamentally, um, we can gain a lot of traction by observing the fact that that if we have updated the model state to time k, and we have samples from that distribution, we can simply take into account the likelihood of observing a new data point given the, the, the state just before this, this time. And the multiplication to is, is guaranteed to be proportional to the probability of observing this, this quantity that we want to take into account, the, the distribution to characterize the distribution of the current state of the model in light of all data to this uh, current point, okay? And um, unfortunately, I don't also have time to, uh, to go into it, but I've given some description in my slides as to how this extends to sampling the full trajectory um, uh, of the state of the model. So we're, instead of just sampling the distribution of things as they currently are right now or as they currently are tomorrow in a cross-sectional manner. We can sample from whole trajectories as they, uh, as the trajectory involved the, the evolution of the state of the system in a particular way. So we've characterized uh, in the previous section the target distribution from which we have to sample. Um, um, for the full trajectories, we have this. For just the state at time k, we have given all the data before, we have to sample from this. And that's all nice and good, but how we actually go about sampling this is itself uh, an intricate, and in fact, beautiful uh, type of challenge. And the fundamental tool we make use of here is what's called important sampling. Um, okay, so um, we use a, a technique of uh, important sampling with the notion being that if we want to sample from a given target distribution, but we don't have a way of easily do this, instead we, we sample from a proposal distribution, which is easier to sample from, and then each particle or each each sample from that is is given a weight, and that weight is higher um, if the ratio of the the value of the distribution. In. So if we get a value a sample an x from q of x, ooh. okay. Um, so we're sampling some value from q of x. And we'll associate that sample x with the weight p of x, what we'd like to be able to sample from, but can't easily divide it by q of x. And what this uh, tends to do is this, this weight will be higher for things that are underrepresented by q of x compared to, to p of x. Okay? And it's lower if, if p of x, um, if q of x tends to, to feature things a great deal compared to how p of x does as a distribution then this ratio will be lower. And the idea is that once we've associated with that, that sample with, with that weight, we can then draw from the samples, uh, these, these weighted samples, um, which we'll be calling particles. 
um, with the probability that's, that's given by that weight. Okay, so here, each particle is associated with the complete state of that model, but it's also associated with the normalized weight, okay? Um, and uh, at any one time, the particles uh, represent a sampling from the state of the model at that time. Um, uh, in this in this important sampling sort of way, and when we want to compute statistics over the distribution, we compute statistics over these samples, um, these particles, uh, weighting, uh, drawing from them according to their with a with a probability proportional to their weight. And as I noted, there's a survival of the fittest of particles. Those that have higher weight are more likely to survive. Um, those that have lower weight are less likely to survive. And there's a fixed number of particles throughout the simulation. So, so for example, we might have a, a model here. Each particle is associated with a particular value for susceptible, exposed, infected, recovered, vaccinated, and perhaps a, a dynamically evolving uh, parameter. Okay, so each particle has its own copy of model state. Between observations, the particles just evolve according to stochastic dynamic model dynamics as we've seen. Particle weights remain invariant. There's no filtering out of particles. There's no new observations. At each observation, the weights are updated to reflect the likelihood of observing the empirical data. And if there's too much disparity of weights, as I had noted earlier, particles are resampled. And that's where there's the survival of the fittest. So here, during the model, we'll sample from, from a proposal distribution, and then we'll multiply, it turns out, uh, the weights of the particle by um, a factor that depends on the, uh, the likelihood as well as other factors. Now, as we'll see, this, uh, this simplifies. So, and for prediction state, remember each particle has a copy, a full copy of the model state. It just runs forward until the next observation, the weights remain unchanged. Okay, so here, the target distribution is as follows, and we draw it from here. Um, and the particle weights, you'll recall, um, when we, excuse me, weights of samples from an importance sample is just taken according to the, uh, to the ratio here. Now it turns out by cleverly picking our proposal distribution, um, we can make calculation of this uh, weight particularly easy, okay? Yeah, calculation in the update phase. So in the update phase, um, we're not going to be able to easily draw a, a sample from posterior distribution. Um, instead, we're going to use these uh, this important sampling technique. Okay, um, uh, and fundamentally, particle filtering gives us a way to update these weights in such a way that, in effect, we're sampling from this target distribution. So here, we're going to be taking a, the previous weight, multiplying it by this quantity, which involves this uh, likelihood uh, function here, um, to get the new weight, okay? Um, so I'm going to advance it by drawing from this, uh, by this, uh, from this proposal distribution and update it accordingly, uh, taking into account account this proposal distribution. Now it turns out that the choice of the proposal distribution can have a big impact. The majority of applications of particle filtering, and all of them for particle MCMC, make use of what's called the condensation algorithm. And the idea here is a very simple one. We're going to make, make use of, uh, for the proposal distribution, will simply make use of, as it were, the, the prior. Um, 
whoa, the distribution of the current state of the model given the previous state. Um, this, is, this is something which uh, is essentially obtained by taking the previous state of the model and running it forward from time k minus 1 to time k. Uh, if we choose that as our proposal distribution, the proposal distribution that's used within the context of important sample, within this, within this context, within the context of, of, of important sampling, um, we're going to have an enormous simplification. Specifically, the new weight will just be the, the prior weight, and because of cancellations involved, times the likelihood um, for a given particle that we observe this new data. So for a given particle i, we have some state, x sub k and sub i. So this is the state for particle k of dimension n. And we're going to assess for that particle state, what's the likelihood of observing this new data point at time k? Given the state at time k for that particle, that particular particle, what's the likelihood of observing this new data point. And that's going to give us a likelihood. And we're going to multiply that likelihood times the existing weight for that particle to get the new weight for that particle. Okay? Um, I don't have time to discuss the various likelihoods which we've, we've included. So it bears noting that this is an incremental process. We simply, when we take a new observation, we simply, to get the new weight, we simply update the old weight by a quantity that depends only on the current state, the current state, and this new distribution. And that will give you a new weight for that particle, okay? Um, now, at times, we will perform resampling. We will draw from the particles with a probability uh, according to their to their weight. So at a resampling step, we'll have particles at different weights. And we will sample for going forward a new set of weights, a new set of particles, where some particles will be multiplied. We'll have many children, uh, if particularly if they're likely to have a high number of weights and some particles with low number of weights may have zero children. When this happens, we set the weight of each particle to one. Okay, we unitize that, that weight. Now, if we wish to compute statistics over mono quantities, if we want to graph the, the model latent state as those graphs did before, we have to do so over samples from the weighted particles where we sample from them, we draw from them according to their weight, okay? So we shouldn't be computing statistics over the particles themselves, but samples from those particles. Okay, now there's a key need in this process. Unfortunately, I don't have time to go into that further. I've provided lots and lots of slides, provide much more detailed uh, coverage than I've been able to provide here. So I'd like to um, note, however, that the role that stochastics play in the model is a key one. As I noted, we need some stochastics in the model for it to be meaningful to perform particle filtering. All partic otherwise, all particles cloned in the resampling step will just evolve identically. We need there to be some diversity in the particles that are, that are so cloned, you know, multiple children of the same parent. And with the stochastics, we want to navigate between the two extremes. We want to avoid overconfidence. We want the model to allow the model to have a requisite variety of particle values of different hypotheses to match a wide variety of different data, okay? Um, to be corrected by different data in fruitful ways. At the same time, we want to avoid overconfidence. We don't want the model to be, or underconfidence. We don't want the model to be so uncertain that projecting forward it has no understanding, no ability to, with confidence, project forward. And I would note that in this regard, some of the stochastics we incorporate in the model characterize a particular stochastic process. For example, evolution of reporting rates, 
um, or, or contact rates. But sometimes they, they more provide a way of ensuring humility on the part of the model, so it's not overly confident. Okay. Just want to, um, as we're uh, working towards finishing up here, I want to um, note that um, particle filtering is an attractive uh, technique compared to tr more traditional techniques such as Kalman filtering for a variety of reasons. One of those reasons is that particle filtering imposes far less constraints in terms of um, the distributions assumed for the noise um, associated with the stochastic evolution of the system and with um, measurement noise, and the noise associated with, um, with observations. Um, in common filtering, these are assumed to be Gaussian in character. There's no such constraint in particle filtering. It's a highly versatile technique in terms of having low constraints. But another real attraction associated with it is the fact that that whilst common filtering requires linearization of the underlying state um, state equations, a particle filtering requires no such assumption. Um, and as a result, it, it can readily be applied with uh, models that are not directly formulated within an within a state equation, excuse me, an ordinary differential equation format. However, um, we've done quite a bit of experimentation with ABMs with uh, particle filtering. Um, this is, remains an active area of work for us. And I'll simply note that um, our work uh, suggests that it's a more challenging problem than is immediately obvious. Um, not only does it impose very high uh, computational demand perform particle filtering with ABM, the very high dimensionality associated with uh, particle filter uh, with ABMs um, may impose uh, an extraordinarily high uh, number, need for extraordinarily high number of, of particles to, to cover it in a non-sparse way. Um, we're pursuing this, um, very interested in pursuing it, particularly with um, with uh, GPUs, which we use uh, to great effect in other areas, potentially future in, in, with uh, field programmable, uh, field programmable gate arrays uh, and distributed computation as a key key point. Okay, a few points of learning. Particle filtering is a powerful and general technique to bring together ongoing incoming observations on the one hand with dynamic models on the other in a way that takes best advantage of both and in a way that allows us to estimate the current state of the system, to project forward, and to ask what-if questions in probabilistic ways that also prevent that dynamic model from spinning off into increasing disconnection with observations from the world. It regrounds the model in an ongoing way with the model, with the the observations in a way that, that keeps it connected with stochastics from the world and, and prevents model omissions from leading to, to big divergence in many cases. Choice of a likelihood function is very important. I haven't had a chance to discuss that today in, in detail, but for example, we've made heavy use of negative binomial likelihood, some of Poisson, some of binomial, but you have to watch out with binomial and some with normal, but it's a very important choice. Particle filtering, as I noted just in previous slides, needs to balance too little confidence and too much confidence, uh, this being associated with the amount of stochastics introduced. And tuning the probabilistic model parameters makes a big difference, we found, for the accuracy of the particle filtering, the stochastic, um, the, the tuning the stochastics model parameters and stochastics. So for example, for probabilistic model parameters, additionally, there might be um, um, uh, dispersion parameters, for example, associated with negative binomial or Pascal distributions. If the likelihood is too diffuse, particle filtering often will not, uh, may not help that much, um, and it may be necessary to, uh, uh, to tune it further. So a few conclusions here. Uh, particle filtering can take many lines of evidence and give a, a common portrait of the underlying system and how it evolves. 
using both the observations and model logic to illuminate areas of the system that are not directly measurable. It continually regrounds model state given evidence and the latest data. It's well suited to work with some public health data streams and models. I'd say many data in public health streams and models. And in the presence of, of, of um, aggregate dynamic models, it can, it can perform uh, very well in a broad number of these models. Application of particle filtering is not a turn the crank process. It does involve iteration, uh, iteration and learning. And research progress is required to improve support for particle filtering in ABM and DES and to and to explore applications at PMCMC more broadly to two domains. And to do so in a computationally effective fashion. Thanks so much. I do want to just uh, note the, uh, the number of upcoming events of relevance. Most directly relevant this combining data science and system science event um, we're holding in Saskatoon in, in August. Uh, but also this uh, boot camp and agent-based and hybrid modeling and uh, work on our systems for collecting uh, data from smartphones and wearables. Thank you so much for your attention. I hope you found this um, useful contents, and I hope to contribute more in coming months. Thanks so much.